All right, thank you for listening in to the first recording session for PCNE interviews. I am TGA, your host, and today I am interviewing by Hi Cello, or uh, we can go by his pen name, Mark. Mark, want to say hi to the group? Hi to the group. Alrighty. So just kind of get uh, started right off. Uh, if you had to categorize your political, economic, philosophy, or positions, uh, what would they be? My, uh, my political position is as a liberal libertarian. Uh, those are the people who founded our country. If you want evidence of that, you note that the Constitution is written to protect the people from the government, not the other way around. Economics, um, TGA, I'll be 68 this year. I've seen a great many things, and I know that, that capitalism, which is defined as the free movement of capital, both uh, financial and labor, to where it can best be used, is really the only system that ultimately creates wealth. And kind of what influence uh, on these views, both on the political side and economic side? As I said, I'm a liberal libertarian. I was inspired uh, in 1960 by JFK to become a liberal Democrat. I was inspired in 2009 by Nancy Pelosi to become a liberal independent when I uh, observed that the Democratic had abandoned liberalism a couple of decades earlier, at least. Mm -hmm. Well, what is it from uh, JFK's perspective that inspired you to be a liberal Democrat, and then what was it that Nancy pulled off and kind of made you abandon uh, the Democratic Party? Assuming that is when you abandoned it. Um, well, the party abandoned me a lot earlier. Uh, John F. Kennedy today would be running certainly to the right of John Kasich. Uh, he was in favor of individual liberty. Uh, he, like me, acknowledged the ability of, the, uh, of government to do good and was also aware of the fact that if government became too powerful, it could, it could harm. Uh, by 2009, Nancy Pelosi made it, made it abundantly clear that the Democratic Party had no belief at all that government could ever do anything harmful, uh, which is when I simply walked out. Then in terms of your view as a liberal libertarian, how long have you had these views? My views have not changed, uh, probably, in my entire life. So you've never really held any prior views before then? It was kind of strictly liberal, libertarian all the way through? Pretty much. I am what is today known as a liberal libertarian. Uh, those views made me a Democrat back more than 50 years ago, uh, but the Democratic Party abandoned those views. Well, what could you say that influenced you politically to holding that position? Like, how early was it that you knew you were a liberal libertarian? I knew uh, very early that individual liberty was probably the, uh, the single most important uh, element of our society. Uh, and in 1960, both parties held a very similar view. Uh, Democrats wanted to be sure that liberty was conserved, while Republicans wanted to be sure to conserve liberty. Those positions are not far apart. Today, those two parties are very far apart except that neither one is particularly concerned with, uh, with individual liberty. And can you recall kind of when you discovered this whole category of liberal libertarian? Was it in the school or was it the readings that influenced you that, uh, toward that thought? Um, 
Um, when I was about five, my father was getting his master's degree at, I think it was George Washington University. It was in international relations, and he brought home, which included a lot of politics, he brought home his textbooks, and I read them. And uh, some ideas began to form. The idea of a relationship between individuals and government was not really solidified for me until I began to pay attention to politics. In 1960. Okay. And of the books, uh, who would you say would be a huge influencer for you? Whether it be an author or someone from the, uh, a politician in the past? Daniel Patrick Moynihan is a big influence. Um, another big influence, but not someone who convinced me was Anne Rand. Her objectivism is what is what is many times thought of to be libertarianism. It is not. Well, I can already kind of <laughs> predict that a lot of people are already frothing in the mouth when you mention Anne Rand. So uh, just to kind of head that off at a pass, what do you mean by, well, what was it about her objectivism that influenced you? And what was it that you took away from it? And whether you agree 100% or there are certain parts that you only take out and leave others behind. She favored individual liberty, but she, she did not acknowledge the first half of my view of government, which is that it can do good. There are things that only government can do. It's not that we do not need government. We need government. We just don't need a uh, an ever expanding government. So you you would say your biggest difference for, from her is that she is more anarchist per se, and you're saying no, that's that's you only you would stop at the point where she's saying, well, there should be no government. Um, I certainly stop well before that, but yes. Mm -hmm. So what, give us a couple of examples you mentioned, oh, there are certain things that government can do well or is necessary. What would be those particular functions? Uh, several come to light immediately. First, international relations. No state, no individual can conduct international relations. Only a federal government can do that for the United States. Um, defense. Only a federal government can do that. Uh, running a post office, building roads, ultimately providing a safety net for the poorest of the poor. Okay. Then kind of flipping then to the economic side, can you kind of point out what was it that influenced you in, in your particular view? I have lived about, uh, I guess it's now a bit less than half of my life outside the United States. I've seen a lot of systems in action. Uh, as we have been abandoning uh, capitalism now for at least the last 30 years, um, I find us becoming more and more, like, uh, like many countries I've been in, where the government is viewed as the provider uh, and uh, whatever the party of government is in a country, uh, it promotes envy of those who are better off and rather than turn the, uh, turn the citizens' attention inward, seeks to find some common enemy that is going to be easy to hate. We now have large corporations. If you don't believe me, read the posts on PNCE. Large corporations are almost universally slammed as enemies. Uh, you know, give the means of production over to the workers. That doesn't work. It really doesn't. Look at Greece. Look at Poland. Look at what the Soviet Union. 
where experiments in various uh, forms of that were tried. Look at Venezuela. It doesn't work. So have you actually been to these countries or what countries? Yes. That... Oh. Okay. And is it, did you, what well, other? Maybe 40 or 45 others. Did you hold any other views prior to your experience in these other countries? Well, thinking logically through the alternative between free movement of capital and any other system, I figured out that other systems were unlikely to work well. Uh, every system has its victims, and capitalism has as many as any others. But capitalism is not practiced uh, almost anywhere in the world right now. Mm -hmm. okay. Then in terms of either your view, whether it be political or economic, is there a particular position that you find pretty hard to defend? And I'm not saying hard to defend in terms of uh, stating something and someone kind of knee-jerk reacting towards it, but something hard to defend in where you're either not as strongly knowledgeable in the particular field or something that you also having uh, a struggle on accepting? Um, I don't have any trouble accepting being a capitalist and a liberal libertarian. There are, uh, there are points where I view uh, regulation as less necessary than others, but not as unnecessary. Uh, that view seems to be very difficult to get across in uh, my MTJ forum. Can you give us a couple of examples of those situations? Um, as an example of over-regulation, I cited the, uh, the Clinton administration's move on its last day in office to uh, radically change the allowable uh, excuse me, arsenic level in drinking water. Well, everybody wants wants safe drinking water, and nobody wants to be ingesting arsenic, so that's a good thing. Well, the problem is that, f that first, we had not had a death from arsenic poisoning in drinking water for 20 years at that, at that time. Second, the, uh, the change was based on a study of arsenic levels in water in, uh, in Chile, where the levels, they said, okay, well, this, this level, which was somewhere over 400 times the level in the United States, led to X number of deaths, so we, uh, we use that as the standard. You get 400 deaths for that many uh for that level, so we just bring it down, and it says that at the current levels, we should be seeing 25 or 30 or maybe more, but we weren't, because arsenic is a cumulative toxin. It, uh, it, you get those results from Chilean levels in, you know, 30 to 35 years. At U.S. levels, you got it in maybe 500 years. People just don't live long enough to, uh, to accumulate that much of the toxin in their bodies. I was accused by one of our knee-jerk partisans of spinning science. I replied, uh, telling her how uh, the cumulative toxin worked. Uh, oh, she also added that... Uh, you just don't know that uh, arsenic also causes cancer. So I told her, this is where I went to medical school. Where did you do your studies? This is the mechanism whereby arsenic causes cancer or leads to cancer. And this is the mechanism whereby arsenic is a cumulative toxin, leads to other problems. But the, the cancer link is also a cumulative toxin problem. And we just don't live long enough for the low levels of, tox of arsenic in our drinking water to cause cancer. All right. Well, uh, well, we're gonna, for for the time being, we're going to try and 
uh, refrain from referring to any particular posters. I, I know you've uh, held the name back, but we'll, we'll we'll keep the interview just kind of focus on your particular position. Now, uh, in terms of a position that you do hold, is there one that you have absolute conviction in that you find very easy to defend? Equal treatment before the law. Well, it, it kind of sounds obvious, but but to not sound pedantic, I can you give us kind of an example of why would anyone, or rather, you can define it for us because I, I can already see many people could interpret that differently. Treat everybody equally. That's uh, I don't know how you can how you can have another definition. Um, some have a a desire that's that some animals are more equal than others. Uh, for years, that was uh, you know when I grew up, I appeared white. It was not until my forties that I found out I'm one quarter black. That didn't change anything. I knew at the time that seeing a uh, you know in the fifties seeing a sign pointing up to the balcony in a movie theater that said colored uh, was not right. That uh, water fountains labeled white and colored were not right. Uh, People, because of skin color, not being able to, uh, to testify in court in some states, the existence of Jim Crow laws, that's not right. And I knew that in the 50s, had no idea what to do about it, until the 60s when I began joining uh, protests and sit-ins. I've still got scars on my life just from the beatings with those. Uh, That's unequal treatment before the law. Okay. Uh, Then kind of going to one of the last couple of questions. If you somehow uh, became a position of power or president, if there was only one thing that you could accomplish politically, what would that be? Passing an amendment that made it explicit that everyone is equal before the law, and the law cannot discriminate on... uh, on any basis other than tri- crime, such as treason. Okay. Well, we're kind of into uh, the challenge section, so if there's any point in time where you don't want to answer, you can just let me know. So kind huh. of piggybacking uh, off of the equal treatment section now in pc and e there's been uh, quite a bit of conversation in terms of LGBT treatment and several states passing certain laws just on bathrooms. Uh, what is kind of your position and take on it? My position is that transgendered people being able to use the, uh, the restroom that, uh, that fits their, their uh, gender orientation is no big deal. I don't understand why people make it a big deal. Mm-hmm. Then, in, in terms of those particular states or counties or whichever wanted to make said laws, uh, under your administration, would you step over them in terms of a federal mandate or executive action, or would you kind of let them do what they want as a state? Frankly, I would instruct my Justice Department to file suit for unequal treatment before law. Transgendered people are allowed to use a bathroom of their choice. Then everybody needs to be able to use a bathroom of his or her choice. Do not favor or give a special privilege to transgendered people. Well, uh, just kind of playing a devil's advocate here. Uh, those particular groups of people who pass or support said laws uh, are all always talking about, oh, then you're going to allow perverts or anyone kind of going to any bathroom that they want. What would your answer be to them? That being a pervert is not against the law. Acting on perversion is, 
and let's let's criminalize acts, not thoughts. Okay. Then let's kind of uh, go backwards. And uh, you initially mentioned the two people that were of influence to you. One was Daniel Patrick Monaghan, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it from him that influenced you politically? Honest liberalism. Um, he published a paper some 50 years ago, The Negro Family, which foretold exactly what we have today uh, based on rising rates of illegitimacy in the black community. At that time, they were at 35%. Uh, today, they're above 70%, have been for years, and far too many black children grow up in, uh, in single parent homes. The number of statistical studies showing that peer-reviewed statistical studies showing that uh, that single children who grow up in single family households are disadvantaged for the rest of their life. Uh, the prevalence of that is far more among uh, those growing up in single parent households. Their health is worse. Their academic success is worse. Their unemployment rates and incarceration rates are higher. And that goes across the board. The number of white children who grow up with bad outcomes in those areas uh, in, uh, be, uh, and is tracked to single parent households is uh, about the same as, as uh, black, the percentage. So you're trying to attribute the vicious cycle of poverty more towards single parenting than a racial aspect. Is, is that kind of what I'm getting from you? There is a racial aspect. We have a history of hundreds of years of racial bias. It's not gone. My belief is that the race war has been won, but there are skirmishes yet to be fought for maybe another 50 or 100 years. Uh, we have a president who's twice as black as I am, uh, half as black as Oprah, I guess. Uh, what else do you need? Then, in terms of those particular aspects, from poverty to to racial relations, what would it, kind of going back in terms of if you were in an executive position, what would be anything if you were to uh, by executive action or new laws in place? What would you do to solve it? I don't know. I might start out by calling out from the bully pulpit the race war profiteers, those who have a vested interest in continuing the race war. The two who come first to mind are Donald Trump and uh, the Reverend Al Sharpton. Each has a vested interest in continuing the race wars. Um, and so I call them race war profiteers. Mm -hmm. well, then what do you think about the BLM movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. Let me return to something I talked about. Uh, have you ever seen a lynching? Only in textbooks. I have. Have you ever seen crosses burning on someone's front yard? Uh, no, again, only in textbooks and news reports. I have. Have you seen blacks... Uh, in court being uh, refused the ability to testify? I have. Have you seen sundown laws? Colored people have to be out of this town by sundown? I have. Today, the complaint is microaggression and, uh, and uh, sa the need for safe spaces. Uh, that's fine, but the claim is that this is just as racist as things ever have been. I'm sorry, until you've had a policeman 
pull out a nightstick on you, and a sheriff open up with a, uh, with a fire hose on you, and watch your friends being beaten alongside you, then you can say that it's the same as it always has been. There has been progress. Is there enough? No. What is missed is the ability of institutions and society in general to absorb uh, change. The, uh, the change needs to come in, uh, in doses that can be absorbed. If you want to see a prime example of the wrong way to go about it, look at Roe v. Wade. It's, what, 40-odd uh, years later? The war is still going on because there was no ability of the society and institutions to absorb that amount of change overnight. I'm not saying that Roe v. Wade is wrong. I'm saying that a somewhat smaller amount of change being introduced at one time would probably have been better. So it almost sounds like you're more for the pragmatic approach of gradual change as opposed to flipping a switch overnight. No, not gradual, but but induced in increments that can be absorbed by the power centers. Mm, can you just kind of define it as to absorbing by power? Like what? who or what is the power center? Well, let me give you a... Uh, a piece from my background. I was one of the people who had a hand in what became known as Don't Ask, Don't Tell for the military. Today that's excoriated. It was horrible. It, uh, you know, it codified the, uh, uh, cod it, it codified uh, homophobia. Uh, but it introduced as much change as two power centers, society at large and the U.S. military, could absorb at the time. And, what, 20 years later, we have uh, homosexuals able to marry, we have homosexuals able to serve openly in the U.S. military. Uh, and I think that is due in part to introducing only that change that stretches but doesn't break power center's ability to absorb it. Okay. Uh, well, then kind of jumping on the devil's advocate here, I mean, this is, uh, you, you've experienced it a lot in terms of personally with Jim Crow and all, and it wasn't a sudden change. It was not like where laws were made, okay, we will slowly erode or remove certain parts of these laws. It was either 100% segregation or get it out of the box. Um, would your, your position towards that change be different? I'm not sure I understand the, understand the question. Because uh, you were talking about not having change overnight, but something so long as the power structure, I'm assuming this point in government, uh, accepting or absorbing some of these changes and in terms of segregation back then where you have colored versus white uh, facilities kind of going by your philosophy is rather than removing those signs outright is removing said signs or, or method of segregation uh, slowly over time I, mean, which I can't speak to a perfect pace. Uh, I looked at Thurgood Marshall, who brilliantly uh, argued a case before the Supreme Court, and it agreed unanimously with him that uh, because he provided empirical evidence that school segregation was harmful, not just to blacks, but to whites as well. Did that end racism? No. Did it, uh, did it uh, introduce change that uh, society at large and some institutions 
had real trouble accepting? Yes, it did. Uh, the Civil Rights Act and then the Civil Rights, or the Voting Rights Act, introduced change in a larger amount. That, uh, that was good. It was needed. Hell, it had been needed since the 1860s. That introduced change that, uh, that many groups struggled with and continue to struggle with. But it did not introduce change that could absolutely, that would break the ability to absorb. Okay. Well, we are kind of running a little bit of overtime, but the last couple of questions are kind of piggybacking further uh, on the subject here. Uh, I'm trying to remember the exact year, but I there was SCOTUS rule that certain parts of the Voting Rights Act was no longer needed, and almost I'd say yeah, almost overnight, some of the not so surprising states immediately start putting very harsh um, voter suppression laws. If we can, we would just call it as as it is. How would you, what would your stance be if you were in an executive position in terms of putting a new law in place or putting it up to appeal again? I mean, what, what I was would your not stance? file suit against a state that implemented a voter ID law. We require ID to get on an airplane. The Democratic National Committee is requiring ID for anybody to be admitted to its convention this summer. What's wrong with providing ID to vote? The first place where such a law was challenged was in Indiana. The Democratic Party brought the challenge. They couldn't find a single individual who had been harmed by the law, so the court gave them an extra 60 days. They still couldn't find a single individual who'd been harmed by the law. It's, uh, it's nonsense. So kind of going further uh, in terms of the devil's advocate here is their position has been, they, I mean, granted, they might not be able to find a particular individual harm. Their go-to defense is those who may be long retired, given up the driver's license and things like that, where they don't have easy access to ID. Every state gives one the opportunity to get a non-driver's identification card. Uh, it's not hard, and to the best of my knowledge, it's free in all states. Um, the number of people without identification is not race-dependent. It may be more common among black people, but if it's a requirement, then get an identification card of some sort. Uh, it, uh, I'd have to go into a great deal of detail here, but every, every case that's been brought before a court about voter suppression has, uh, or excuse me, voter fraud, has uh, been based on, uh, based on uh, the use of, of uh, very heavily black democratic precincts that report more votes for the Democratic slate than there are residents. Everyone uh, that's, that's been, uh, where a determination of guilt has been found is on the same basis. Uh, I'm sorry, what do you mean same basis on? And uh, let me get the year straight. 1994, Paris Glenn Denning ran for governor of Maryland. Uh, his opponent, Ellen Sauerbrei, the Republican, filed suit claiming voter fraud. A judge who's a Democrat, appointed by a Democrat, agreed with Sauerbrei. There had been massive voter fraud in the heavily black uh, precincts in Baltimore enough so that she should have won the election. He declined to overturn the election because there was no proof that Glenn Denning himself had perpetrated the fraud. 
I guess that's that's enough. Um, but he was on record as saying, yes, the election was decided by fraud. We go to a couple of more recent cases where by, uh, you know, another eight or ten years later, uh, anybody who said anything with the word black or race in it or African American was instantly labeled a racist. Christine Gregoire was uh, defeated for governor of, uh, excuse me, for governor of, uh, of Washington until just enough votes were found from overwhelmingly black precincts. Uh, in a box, uh, in a closet, suddenly found just enough to give her a small victory. Al Franken was the same thing, except that these fortuitously discovered votes were in the back seat of a car. Um, anybody who objected was obviously a racist. So they both took office. Interesting. Okay. Uh, well, we are at uh, 35 minutes and, and going we are a little bit uh, somewhat over time, but I do want to thank you for volunteering as a first participant sure. for PC and interviews. I'll be posting this up on YouTube sometime tonight or tomorrow. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Have a good